So um, disclaimer for this presentation, it assumes that you know the basics of B4 security and you know the basics of our um, the basic IPv6 security. And the reason for which I included this disclaimer is usually when when you um, watch B6 uh, security presentations, half of the presentation if is uh, IPv6 introduction. So there's nothing like this in here, or shouldn't be much of that. And uh, second one is that this is again work in progress. So if you have comments, criticisms, and that kind of stuff, it's welcome. So what's the motivation for this presentation? Uh, Sooner or later, you will be deploying IPv6, and in practice, uh, you will most likely you have already at least actually deployed it, because in most in the case of most general purpose operating systems, they already ship um, IPv6 support enabled by default. Even if you cannot use it to uh, access the global internet, uh, that support is still there at least for local communications. Uh, we all know that there are a number of uh, Challenges, security challenges, and also operational challenges that come with IPv6. So the question here is what we can do about them. And uh, I will kind of like uh, go through the possible uh, possible options. And even when some of them may sound funny or may look funny, uh, there are different communities that adopt each of the different options. So option one is essentially to uh, ignore those challenges. Uh, even when this may sound stupid or it is stupid, uh, you may see that many of the proponents of IPv6, uh, in some cases, th th this is kind of like the case in some tax forces, to my experience, uh, they think that discussing IPv6 security issues goes against IPv6 deployment. So for the most part, they try to ignore them and try to uh, prevent discussions of those things from going on. Uh, Option two, it's essentially, well, sometimes it's a consequence of, of option one. So you start ignoring the V6 security issues, but eventually you find out about them and it doesn't look or they don't look really nice. And option three is uh, the path that we are trying to follow, which is about discussing the security implications of V6 and trying to do something about them. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think since 2007 or so, I've been working most of the time on IPv6 security research. Uh, so far, the work has been about, or the project has been about, analyzing the IPv6 uh, in, uh, specifications, uh, trying to f uh, and, and trying to find out ways in which uh, you could actually break uh, an IPv6 implementation. We uh, didn't just look on the specifications themselves because usually uh, there are many things that are left to implementations. So in many cases, we also look at what implementations were doing. Um, and when we actually found the things that could break, uh, we produced tools to actually assess those issues. Um, and in those cases in which we were able to confirm that there were vulnerabilities or, or there were things that could be used to, for DOS or, 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 yeah, even complete DOS of uh, some implementations, we tried to contact vendors uh, and have them patch their own uh, implementations uh, in the hopes of improving B6 security. Uh, part of this stuff has already been taken to the ATF. And not all of the stuff, not all of the work that we have uh, produced so far, because in some cases there are vulnerabilities that have not yet been patched. So um, we are uh, trying to take most of the stuff to the ITF, and the idea is that during this year we will complete the rest of the stuff that we have not yet submitted there. Um, well, this talk is about ongoing work, our ongoing work to improve IPv6 security. Uh, again, this presentation shouldn't be taken as a lecture, but, but actually as uh, a way of proposing ideas of uh, fixing things. So if you have a different idea or a different approach on how to approach many of the issues that I will be discussing, so um, please uh, speak up. So first one is about answers in IP addressing. Uh, this is the only slide that I have for as a kind of introduction to the topic. This is the syntax of uh, global IPv6 addresses. 
Um, essentially, they are the same as before addresses. You have a, globi a global routing prefix, which is the that is assigned by your app string. Then you have a few bits for uh, the subnet ID, which is the same thing that you do for before already. And then finally, probably the only difference is that in IPv6 you have an face ID, which is analogous to the host ID part in the, in the IPv4 addresses. The only thing that changes um, in the case of IPv6 is that the interface ID is much larger, and there are actually uh, different ways in which you can select that value. Of course, typically in the case of B4, uh, since the addresses are scarce, uh, usually select them like sequentially, whereas in the case of IPv6, since you have uh, 64 bits, you have several options uh, for selecting the interface ID. So the possibilities are, uh, well, the first one, which is the traditional stateless auto configuration, is to include the MAC address in the interface ID. There are some, bit, some bits that are changed, some bits that are flipped, but essentially you include the, um, the MAC address there. Another possibility is to include the before address uh, in the interface ID. That's usually done, for example, in, in uh, infrastructure assist, uh, devices, uh, in which, for example, if you, can, uh, if you recall, uh, if you remember the, the IP before address of a system, then it's kind of like straightforward generate the interface ID in that way so that the IPv6 address is also easy to, to remember. Uh, then in the third bullet, low byte addresses. Essentially, it's uh, when you have low byte addresses, you set the interface ID to all zeros, and then you just change the last byte. That's usually the result of manual configuration. Typically, if you are going to manually configure an address, you don't uh, select the, so many um, bytes randomly, but you just set them all to zeros, and then you just change the last one. Uh, then you have worthy addresses that are not that usual, but are still there in, the, in, in real networks. In this case, for example, the address includes the word dead beef. And uh, for example, last year in, uh, during the World IPv6 Day, uh, I think Facebook's, uh, Facebook's uh, address was encoded in a similar way to this. There are some addresses like this, even when it may sound funny or, or uh, yeah. And finally, the last bullet talks about um, transition and coexistence technologies. For example, if you have 6 to 4 or you have Tirido or other transition technologies, in some cases, they mandate the way in which you have to select the interface ID. So um, let's uh, take a look at, the, the, at some of the problems that these uh, these possibilities have. You may have here the urban legend that uh, thanks to the increased IPv6 address space, uh, IPv6 host scanning attacks are impossible. Uh, actually, this, this wasn't just a quote that I randomly produced, but actually I, I looked IPv6 scanning on the web, and this is one of the ones that came up. Uh, there are worse numbers. Uh, these guys say that um, you, it should take something like 500 million years to produce a host scanning attacks, but there are other guys that produce like even larger numbers. Uh, so the idea is to try to analyze this, what I think is a urban legend, and try to find out whether uh, this is true or whether it isn't. So um, as a kind of introduction to the problem, usually the guys that uh, come up with these numbers assume that if you have to scan uh, an IPv6 subnetwork, you have to go through the entire slash um, 64. So the question here is whether uh, at the point in which you want to uh, scan an IPv6 subnet, the search space is really 64 bits or not. So this is the only study that I could find uh, in which some guy, David Malone, measure how IPv6 addresses are assigned in practice. There is a couple of problems with this study. Uh, the first one is that it dates back, it dates back to 2008, which means that it's a bit old. And since the way in which v uh, 6 addresses are generated over time. For example, as time has passed by, uh, there are more systems that implement temporary addresses and other things. So probably you could argue that these results are obsolete or a little bit obsolete nowadays. But uh, so far, this is the only uh, work, the only research work that I have that I have been able to find that uh, 
has uh, taken care of, of, of measuring how addresses are, are selected in the internet. So what this guy did essentially was um, he uh, set up, I think it was a web server, had different clients connect to them, to, to, the, to the server, and he just logged the addresses and tried to analyze the different ways in which those addresses were selected. So for the case of host, which of course were the systems that connected to, the, to his web or FTP server or whatever, this guy found out that 50% uh, of the addresses were the result of stateless <coughs> auto configuration, which means that um, they were addresses that were including the MAC address in the interface ID. Then there was a 20% of addresses that included an IPv4 address in the interface ID. Then a 10% of Tirido uh, addresses for the most part, they are usually the result of Windows systems, even when they are, uh, there are in open source implementations. Uh, I would say that, um, that Tirido provides like a very pure, uh, very, very poor um, user experience. Pure. Um, and then we have 8% uh, of load byte addresses and a 6% of privacy addresses, which are what are usually called or known as temporary addresses. Again, if you look at this table, there are, uh, you can sort of tell that uh, these statistics have probably changed over time. And one of the reasons are, uh, for example, that uh, in the last few years, privacy addresses have been incorporated into more implementations. So, um, for example, Windows, uh, FreeBSD, and other kind of thing that OpenBSD uh, implemented that not that long ago. Uh, so these numbers are supposed to be changed, changing if they have not changed already. And another thing that could be a sign that uh, this uh, study didn't actually measure like uh, like a broad population of of host is that it uh, found out a 20 percent of IPv4 base addresses are you and usually uh, only manually configured hosts have a 20 percent have a, a IPv4 base addresses so it's very likely that most of the users that were accessing the web server or, FT, or FTP server were kind of like technical users that had configured IPv6 uh, manually so these numbers should change now if you take a look at the second table that provides this uh, the um, statistics for uh, router addresses, you, uh, you can see that there is a 70% of low byte addresses, which means that in most cases, and this shouldn't come up as a surprise, 70% of the addresses are manually configured, so that's why they are low byte. The interface ID is set to all zeros, and the, the, the administrator just changed the last byte. Then you have a 5% of IPv4 based addresses, and then the rest of the numbers are mostly marginal. Um, this slide contains the URL of this study, and I find it like quite interesting and important, first of all, because it was one of the few guys that actually cared to measure the IPv6 internet. So uh, I have been chasing this guy to reproduce the same study again, and hopefully either this year or next year, he will repeat this study so that we get more up-to-date numbers. So let's take a look at the at those addresses types that had the larger percentage. Um, one of the address types that I described was, the, was those addresses that result from uh, Slack or auto configuration. And essentially, those addresses include the MAC address in the interface ID. So this slide, this slide um, describes or illustrates the syntax of just the interface ID, not the global routing prefix or the subnet ID, but just the interface ID. So what you can see is that essentially what you do is you split the MAC address in two, and you stuff two bytes, which are like fixed, in the middle, OK? There's actually an additional change that you do, which is flipping one of the bits in the IEEE OUI, which is the universal and, uh, universal and local bit. But essentially what you do is you split the MAC address in two, and you stuff those two bytes in the middle. So let's think, for example, that um, you think, or let's 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 uh, let's assume that you know, or you can guess the, the the first three bytes. And what is the reason for which you could know those three the, those first three bytes? Let's say that an attacker is trying to uh, perform an IPv6 
and of a target network and let's just assume that that target network is that of a big uh, computer vendor and it wouldn't be that crazy to assume that all of the systems or most of the systems that have been deployed on that network are manufactured by that vendor itself. So if you were to scan, let's say, an HP network, well, it, it's most likely the case that there are HP servers on, uh, in, in that network, and you could tell what the first three bytes of the interface ID, or put another way, what are the, the what is the I3 uh, OUI uh, for that vendor. So if you assume that you can guess or know the uh, first three bytes, then the second, the, the, then the, the two fixed bytes, of course, are known. And then you are left with only 24 bits, uh, which would mean that you have reduced the search space from the original slash 64 to only 24 bits. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to take a couple of minutes to scan an IPv6 network, but it's certainly a big change when compared to the slash 64 bits that was assumed or that is usually assumed. Now, there are other things that should be taken into account. For example, um, if it's a large organization, they usually, they usually don't purchase just a single system, but they usually purchase systems in a bunch of them. And uh, one thing that we have found, uh, that we have found is that um, the last three bytes of the MAC address, even when they could be like randomly selected, they are usually um, sequentially selected. So let's say if I buy 100 boxes from the same vendor, chances are that the MAC addresses are sequential, right? So if uh, you have that kind of information of the target network, rather than just trying random addresses in, the, in, the, in that IPv6 subnet, uh, you could just random places in the other space, like playing, uh, I don't know if uh, it's a popular ga game here, Naval Battle, when you know that you have a ship that, is, that has four squares, so you don't need to, sh to, uh, to shoot like every square, but if I know that the ship is, let's say, two squares, I shoot here and here and there, so that's one possible approach to actually uh, scan an IPv6 network if you know, for example, that... Uh, that the target network has purchased equipments or, or, or boxes in uh, large bunches. Uh, another thing that we have found, and we are actually working on, on some document to, to publish these results, is that even if the same organization doesn't own con the, all the consecutive MAC addresses, usually the consecutive MAC addresses are within the same, uh, are uh, geographically close, because usually there was some company or some provider that bought those bunch of boxes, so then usually they sold those boxes to places or companies or organizations that are, that are in geographically close uh, locations, right? So that means that if, for example, you have any kind of information about uh, the, the, the MAC addresses of vendor or of some vendor in the region, uh, and if you know that there is some other organization that has purchased equipment from the same vendor recently, then uh, that information can be useful to actually perform an IPv6 uh, scan on the target network. So more about the IPv6 addresses that embed the, the MAC addresses. Uh, another interesting case is that of uh, virtualization. For example, if you take a look at VirtualBox, they always select the, um, the MAC addresses from the same uh, IEEE UI. So in this case, it's 080027, which means that if your uh, IPv6 scanning attack is targeting virtual boxes, then uh, you, you don't even have to guess the, the first uh, three bytes of the MAC address. They are actually known. Uh, VMware is even a more interesting case because, for example, if you use automatic MAC addresses, which means that you didn't manually configure them, uh, they use a fixed uh, uh, IEEE UI, and then the next 16 bits, bits are taken from the IPv4 um, address of the real host. The only bits that change are the low other eight, other eight, eight bits, which means that the search space is reduced in that case to only eight bits. Uh, in the case of manually configure uh, MAC addresses in VMware, they use a different uh, IEEE UI, which is 005056, 
And uh, for the rest of, of the bits, they don't really randomize them, but select them from the range that is specified in this slide. I mean, they randomize the, range, the, the value, but they don't use the whole space that is available, OK? So in that other case, manually configure uh, MAC addresses in VMware, the search space is reduced to uh, 22 bits. Taking a look at other, uh, taking a look at the other uh, address types that uh, have like kind of like large uh, percentage. Uh, if you look at IPv6 addresses that embed an IPv4 address, uh, they typically look as that address in the second ballot. Uh, well, actually, I missed a digit there. Uh, but essentially, the idea is that uh, since they embed an IPv4 address. Uh, the search space is the same as in the IPv4 case. So if you know the B6, the B4 range that they are using, essentially you just scan, you just search through the B4 range, but not just randomly. In the case of low byte addresses, of course this is trivial. So usually what uh, you find is that they set the interface ID to all zeros and they just change the last byte. Um, so in that case, the search space would be, for example, just eight bits. But there are other cases. For example, we have found that some organizations they don't change just the last, just the last byte, but for example, they change the, the let's say the second byte starting from the right or the third byte starting from the right. So there are a few other variants. But in any case, um, you could if if you were to get kind of, of network, you could probably try the first, uh, first few values in the last byte, then the first few values in the second last byte, and, and so on. So in the worst case scenario, usually the search space is 8 bits or, or 16 bits. So this was the first problem, and the, the, the bottom line is that uh, IPv6 host scanning attacks are really feasible. Um, I'd say that... Um, the only thing that will probably change uh, when compared to IPv4 is that in IPv4, the scale of the problem was so small that even doing uh, a poor job was good enough. Now, in the case of B6, if you just try to, to go through the entire slash 64, yes, you are not going to be able to find anything there. But if you were to implement like heuristics in your scanning tool, uh, then my take is that these uh, scanning attacks are, are possible. There is another issue with uh, IPv6 addresses. Uh, if you look at the traditional, uh, at the way in which uh, addresses, IPv6 addresses are generated with Slack, uh, as I said before, they typically include the MAC address in the interface ID. So what's the problem with that? The, interface, the, the MAC address is a globally unique value, which means that you are including like a kind of uh, super cookie in the interface ID, which means that even as you move from one network to another, the interface ID is going to be constant. So I connect to his web server, and then I connect to that other web server, and then I move to another network, and I connect to the same two servers. They can tell that I'm the same system that was accessing them uh, in the other network. Um, so this is just one example. Uh, in the first, in the in this bullet, you can see that there is a, a, a node that generates an address in which the subnet ID, if you want, is just one. Then in the second case, the subnet ID could be two. But in the two cases, the interface ID is the same. Because again, it is including the MAC address in the interface ID. So this introduces a problem that we didn't have in IPv4, which is a problem with privacy. You are kind of like disclosing the identity of your own device. So. Um, I will just go through the two mitigations that have been around for these two problems. Uh, then we'll uh, comment on why they are not really effective. And then I will try to describe what we have uh, suggested on this topic. So uh, when it comes to the problem of host tracking, uh, the solution that the ITF produced years ago was uh, what is usually known as privacy addresses or temporary addresses. Essentially, they are addresses that are randomized. So, uh, well, the idea is that if you use random addresses, of course, it's not going to be possible to track you at least uh, just looking at the at the at the interface ID. The problem is that uh, in the way in which the 
IP addresses were specified, they require you to have not just privacy addresses, but also the traditional Slack addresses. So the idea is that you use these temporary addresses in addition to the traditional auto configuration addresses, but not in replacement of, of those addresses. So what are the problems of, of that approach? Um, first of all, temporary addresses are difficult to manage. Uh, many, I know of many, many uh, people that are disabling these addresses because the, if these addresses are enabled on their network, let's say that some system gets infected and then they, 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 they notice that, let's say a couple of days later, uh, so they say, okay, what was the system that was using this blah blah IPv6 address. Since addresses since these IPv6 addresses change over time, it's not possible to tell that, right? And since auto configuration doesn't require like central management, you don't have any kind of central log that tells you uh, which system was using which address at which point in time. So this is one of the reasons for which many people are disa disabling them. Another uh, problem with this is that, as I said before, these addresses are used in addition to the Slack addresses. So even when uh, tracking a host that employs these addresses is harder, uh, it's not really impossible. Let's say that he is connecting to my web server. Uh, when he connects to my web server, I could uh, obtain his uh, Slack address. And then at some other point in time, when he connects from some other network, I can always actually, for example, send a ping or send some kind of proof, proof packet to the stable address, to the traditional Slack address, and find out whether uh, that system is there or not. So the idea is that the problem with the, the temporary or privacy addresses is that they don't replace the, the addresses that include the MAC address but are used in addition. And as long as there is some kind of address that uses a globally unique value, uh, host using those addresses will still be uh, possible to track. Um, there are some things that have been done in the industry to mitigate the problem of host scanning. Uh, if you take a look, for example, I think it's uh, from Windows Vista and on, what they do is they have replaced the IPv6 addresses that include the MAC address in the interface ID. And what they do is they just randomize the interface ID. Uh, essentially, they use the same algorithm as for temporary addresses. The only difference that they, those, that address doesn't change over time. So same algorithm, and they use it twice. Once for the stable address, once for the temporary address, with the only difference being that for the temporary addresses, they, the addresses are generated over time. Of course, this, uh, this mitigation mitigates the problem of uh, host tracking because the idea, or partially mitigates the, the, the sorry, it mitigates the problem of um, host scanning because they're, they're, uh, if you generate the addresses randomly, uh, those addresses will not follow any specific pattern. So you can actually mitigate uh, host scanning attacks this way. But as I mentioned before, um, since these addresses are still stable, they are going to, there is going to be a unique ID value that is used over time. So it, it is still possible to track systems even if they implement this, this, uh, this, this feature. So this mitigates host scanning attacks, but uh, it still makes possible the, the um, uh, host tracking attack. So this slide, this slide tried to summarize the, the type of interface IDs that, that we have for auto configuration. So I, I've made two categories, stable and temporary, unpredictable and unpredictable. So for example, if you take a look at the addresses that include the MAC address in the interface ID, they are, of course, stable and predictable. Predictable in the sense that, of course, they follow a pattern. Uh, if, you, if you take a look at, that, at uh, temporary or privacy addresses, uh, they are unpredictable because, of course, they are, um, uh, they are randomized and they are also temporary. And, but the thing that we are missing is addresses that are stable, addresses that, for example, you want to use for a server, for example, 
uh, that, are, again, are stable but not predictable. So the idea is that if I had, for example, 100 nodes connected to the network and I wanted those nodes to have stable addresses, I, 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 I still don't want the addresses to follow a pattern. Uh, and I still want uh, to be able to uh, make the life of an attacker from, uh, uh, harder when it comes to, to scanning that network. So this is the, sch the scheme that we have uh, proposed. It's uh, very straightforward and it has actually been modeled about uh, RFC 1948. Um, essentially the idea is to uh, produce the interface ID uh, as a result of a a hash function uh, over a prefix, interface index, network ID, and a secret key. Of course, the idea is that the function, this function f is, it has to be uh, um, cryptographically secure. So, uh, and of course, the, the security of this mechanism relies on the hash function being secure and also on the secret key being actually secret, right? Uh, so, the idea is that um, as long as you are connected to the same network, or whether you go out of that network but you reconnect to the same network again, all, this, all the parameters that uh, you include or you send to the, to the hash function are going to remain the same, right? You don't change the secret key, the prefix is going to be the same, the interface index is going to be the same, the network ID is going to be the same, so uh, being the hash function the same thing and being all the parameters the same thing, going to produce the same interface ID all the time. So the idea is I connect to the network, I get one address, I go somewhere else, come back to the network, exactly the same address. So it's, the address is stable within that network, within just one network. Now let's say that I move to a different network, at least the prefix is going to change. So if the prefix, if, if the prefix changes, then the resulting interface ID is going to change. So what we get with this function is that we get addresses that uh, are stable within each network, which means that it's, uh, it's something good for, for, from an operational point of view. But at the same time, the interface ID changes when I move from one network to another, OK? So this is kind of like uh, having the, the best of both worlds. So uh, in the case of addresses that included the MAC address, the good thing was that uh, the addresses were stable, so they were easy to, uh, to manage but they were predictable, so that was a problem. Then on the other hand, you had temporary addresses, which were not predictable, but since they were varying over time, they were hard to manage. So what we want here is to have addresses that, again, are stable within each network. So within your network, the addresses are stable, but when you move from one network to another, they, uh, they change. This proposal was sent to the ITF a few months ago, and um, it has already been accepted by the six-month working group, the only minor comment here is that, um, from my perspective, uh, some standards should have been formally updated, and for reasons that are not exactly clear to me, um, they want to standardize this, but without uh, formally updating some of the standards that we have for, for producing interface ID. So bottom line is that uh, if even when, we, even when we publish this as an RFC, you could still be compliant even if you uh, were producing predictable interface IDs. But again, I think that uh, even then, uh, it's uh, good uh, to have some kind of standardized uh, algorithm uh, for producing interface IDs that don't suffer from the problem I was describing before. Yeah? So Well, in the, there are two options for that. Uh, in the current ID, the, the idea that uh, I think dates back, dates back to a month ago or so, I didn't address that point because it's not even addressed in, the other, in any other case, right? So I, I, it wasn't actually that I didn't want to address that, but I was asking, well, should we address this problem in all the documents or it, this is something that is kind of like left to implementations? What I'm probably going to do in uh, next revision of this document is to include a counter here. So the idea is that if you find a collision, you just increase the counter. Now, I mean, that's, in that case is that if you want the address to be stable, then you should somehow record the address in uh, stable memory, right? Because let's say that I connect to a network, okay? So there was some system using the same address. So I find a collision, so I need to generate another address. Now, let's say I 
disconnect, back, but when I come back, that system is not there. So I would be configuring that system's address. So the problem in that case is that you should record the address uh, somewhere, but well, there's no other way to go. Okay? So a couple of comments about uh, fragmentation and uh, reassembly. Uh, this is the IPv6 fragment header. Essentially, it includes all the fields that you already had in, uh, in the fixed IPv4 header, but in this case, it's they are just included in an optional header. So far, we are um, mostly uh, concerned about only these two fields, fragment offset and identification. So uh, first of all, let's start talking a little bit about the fragment identification value. Uh, the security implications of predictable fragment IDs have been known for so many years. Uh, the implications are denial of service attacks, evil scans, and, and so on. And um, in the case of, of, uh, of IPv6, I mean, if we were to have a problem with this, the problem could potentially be worse because of two problems. Uh, well, essentially, the packets are going to be larger, so it's more likely that we're going to be using fragmentation. So we should really get this right, or, uh, or we were supposed to, to get this right. Um, before actually looking at implementations, I thought that uh, I wouldn't find any implementations that had problems with the interface ID because it was so known that uh, probably was fixed already. And actually, we kind of like uh, faced the same problem for different kinds of IDs in the TCP IP protocols, from port numbers to um, uh, DNS transaction IDs and uh, other values. But the thing is that uh, not in all cases uh, they were using unpredictable values. So this is, these are the, the results that I got while assessing some, some implementations. For example, well, there was uh, Windows and Linux and, and Solaris that had predictable, uh, predictable uh, fragment identification values. Um, of course, the worst options were the ones being employed by Windows and Linux because they were using a global counter that was, uh, again, global counter, and it was initialized to zero. So if you could sample just a single fragment identification value, you could tell the fragment identification that those systems were going to use in the future. Then you have, for example, in the case of Solaris, uh, they are predictable, but it's not so bad uh, because uh, they use a per destination counter rather than a global counter. So it's not as bad, uh, it's not as bad as in the case of, of, of Linux or, or Windows. Um, there were different algorithms in use by different implementations, at least the last time that I had checked. Uh, for example, FreeBSD was using, uh, was randomized, I think it was a linear congruential, congruential generator for uh, FreeBSD, I don't recall exactly. But then, for example, we found out that in OpenBSD, they were using a more interesting algorithm based on the Skipshack algorithm. So, um, well, we produced tools to actually uh, automatically assess whether an implementation was, was generating uh, predictable values or not, whether they were using a, a per destination counter or a global counter and so on. And the uh, good news with this is that um, there were a few systems that were patched as a result of this work. For example, I don't recall which is the, the version of Solaris that fixed this, but they have already patched this one. Uh, well, there is a problem here. Um, I think, yeah, Linux, uh, I think was in November last year, they patched their fragment identification algorithm and they are now doing uh, uh, unpredictable fragment identification values. Uh, another problem has to do with uh, overlapping fragments. The problems with overlapping fragments, again, have been known for so many years. There's the, uh, the TASEC and Newsham paper that was published in the late 90s about how you can uh, evade uh, network intrusion detection system by, uh, by means of overlapping fragments. Uh, so the idea here is exactly the same, with the only difference being that in the case of IPv4, there was a legitimate reason for overlapping fragments, because in IPv4, you, uh, routers can uh, fragment packets and then packets can be duplicated, follow different paths, and so on. So there is 
case in theory, uh, a legitimate case for overlap and fragments. In the case of IPv6, there is not a legitimate case for them, but uh, um, overlap and fragments were still allowed in the, by, the, um, by the ITF specifications. I think it was last year or a couple of years ago, uh, RFC uh, 5722 was published and essentially they, uh, they say that the use of overlapping fragments uh, was forbidden. So if you were to receive uh, overlapping fragments, you had to just drop the two fragments. Um, the implementations that we checked so far, uh, most of the current ones already implement RFC uh, 5722, most of them. I don't know if, we, uh, okay, so I didn't include the table here, but uh, if you look at our blog, uh, there is a big table of all the tests that we did with different implementations uh, to try to assess the, the, fragment, the fragment reassembly policy that implement. I mean, in, in the blog, uh, it's not just about whether they allow over overlapping fragments or not, but also in the case that they overlap, they allow overlapping fragments, whether they use the first copy, the last copy, or, or whatever. So um, there is a special case of overlapping fragments which has to do with what uh, we ended up calling atomic, fragment, atomic fragments, which are uh, IPv6 fragments that uh, in, uh, IPv6 packets that include a fragment header uh, that have a fragment offset of zero, but that have the more fragment bits set to zero. Essentially, it's a first fragment without any following fragments, okay? And the reason for which those packets can be generated in practice is because of um, translating devices, at, uh, at least as, as far as the uh, ITF specifications go, they say that there are these translation boxes that uh, require packets to have a fragment header if they need to uh, fragment that packet in the IPv4 world. So if, for example, you were to receive a packet to big message advertising an MTU smaller than 1280, which is the IPv6 MTU, you are not required to actually fragment, but you still need to include a fragment header. And that will result into an atomic fragment. The problem or the, the, special, or the, the special thing with these atomic fragments is that um, if you were to, rece to receive one of these fragments, you don't need to mix these fragments with real fragments. Right? Because the whole thing, the whole packet, is included in the same fragment. It's just a first fragment without any other fragments following, which is another way to say that the packet is not really fragmented. It just contains a fragment header. Uh, so our proposal was obvious. The idea was that if you were to receive a packet that had a fragment offset of zero and, a more and the more fragment bits uh, set to zero, you had to process that packet without actually mixing it with, uh, with the other fragmented traffic. So this is an assessment, assessment that we did for, um, with uh, some implementations. Uh, some of them were already uh, implemented this improved processing of, of atomic fragments uh, even before we actually worked on this. Uh, and there were a few other ones that implemented this behavior when we, uh, when we published our, uh, in, uh, our internet draft. I think, I don't recall if it was, I think Open, well, OpenBSD patch. This was, this was kind of coincidence because we were just working on that anyway. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, but the idea again is that well, if you were, this is something that is, uh, shouldn't be hard to implement and that uh, at the same time can prevent, the, can prevent uh, fragmentation attacks uh, to be performed against any system. One thing that you should have in mind is that uh, in IPv6, you could actually uh, cause a system to include a fragment header just by sending a packet to big message. So at the point in which they start including a fragmentation header, uh, you can start forming or you can, uh, you can start exploiting fragmentation attacks. So I think it's very important to get the atomic fragment thing uh, right and also the fragment identification thing right. The bad news about this is that um, 
I was lucky enough to have, um, I don't know if you know a guy called Ivan Arce, he's from Core Secure Technologies, a company that does a lot of vulnerability research, and the guy did a very, a very good review of the document, which led to many, many improvements, and then when I published a revision uh, addressing all his comments, I, uh, I, I, made a, I announced that on the relevant IETF list, and some guys argued that we, we have to do nothing about this. So essentially, some people uh, seem to think that we can go on with the predictable uh, fragment ID or predi predictable identifiers uh, in protocols. A uh, couple of comments about what is sometimes referred to as uh, IPv6 first hop security. Well, the idea with first hop security is that, uh, is that well, first hop security are security measures that you can uh, employ in your local network, either in your host, either in your uh, local switch, or in the first hop router. Um, it's, this concept is not really new from the IPv6 world. Uh, it's something that is there already uh, with IPv4. For example, in the IPv4 world, uh, you can monitor ARP with tools such as ARP Watch, and there are also things that you can uh, do such as DHCP snooping, which means, for example, that you have a switch here, and you say, okay, I'm going to uh, run a, a DHCP server, I'm going to connect the DHCP server on port one, so the other ports shouldn't be able to send DHCP server packets, right? Uh, so that kind of functionality, at least in theory, allows you to block uh, attacks based on, on, on DHCP server packets. Uh, the idea is, of course, that we would like to have um, parity of features uh, with IPv4 in IPv6. So this is a problem that you usually find when you try to actually achieve uh, that, fit, that uh, uh, um, parity of features. The problem is really that um, in IPv6, for example, all the... Uh, all the traffic for address resolution, for example, is, is uh, done with IPv6 packets rather than link layer packets uh, as in the case of, of, of ARP in the v4 uh, world. So for example, uh, an attacker could produce a router advertisement message that includes, for example, a couple of destination options here and then the actual router advertisement. But before actually sending the packet, the attacker could fragment that packet into two pieces. So you end up with these two packets, and it's impossible to actually find out what information is inside the packet at, unless you reassemble the packet, right? But the idea is that you implement this kind of mitigation at the switch. So you should be really crazy to actually think about fragment, fragment reassembly at the switch, right? Or if you were to try to do that, then you open the door to a bunch of other attacks that you don't really want there. So, um, what are the, the proposals that we have for, uh, um, for bringing some level of sanity to the neighbor discovery traffic? So one of the proposals is essentially uh, to uh, forbid the use of fragmentation for neighbor discovery. Uh, in practice, you don't really need to fragment packets in neighbor discovery. And for example, for example, if you wanted to include lots of configuration information in a router advertisement, you could just split that information in different, in different packets. You don't need to include all that in the same packet. The only legitimate case that there could be for, for, uh, for fragmented uh, neighbor discovery traffic uh, is the use of send. Send essentially needs to include certificates in those packets. So if the certificate is large enough, you have no other option than to split the packet with fragmentation. But the thing is that if you were lucky enough to get a send deployment right, which probably you don't want to, uh, relying, on relying on fragmentation wouldn't be a good idea because you have spend all this effort in deploying send, and then an attacker could just disable send by sending fragmented traffic. So if, we, for example, you are going to send the certificates in multiple fragments, and I was an attacker connected to your network, I could, I could just send fragments that collide with your own fragments, and I, would, I could DOS send. So there is, uh, I don't think it's a good idea at all to actually use uh, fragmentation even for send. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
Actually, I seem to recall, but I don't recall the, actually, the, the, the actual implementation, but I seem to recall playing with some implementations that already do that. Uh, probably not because, I don't, I don't know whether they, they meant to do that, but that's the way they work in practice. So, for example, with tools, I was sending uh, a, a, a router advertisement, but fragmented into two pieces, and they were ignoring the packet. So that's a good thing to do. And at the point in which you actually forbid the use of, uh, of fragmentation, it's possible to uh, actually monitor the neighbor discovery traffic or anything because you have all the information in a single packet. So you don't need to do like a, a stateful inspection. So um, we send a proposal uh, to the IETF. Uh, apparently there was support for it, but uh, they didn't want to uh, talk about adoption of this document at the last IETF in, in Paris. And the six-month working group is supposed to be all about this uh, in the short term. Uh, another mechanism that we have in IPv6 is what is called router advertisement guard. Essentially, it's kind of like the same thing that we have in IPv4 for uh, the HCP, the HCP snooping. But in this case, what we want is to filter router advertisement messages uh, based, for example, on the port on which they are received. The problem with uh, router advertisement guard is essentially the same or very similar to the one that we discussed before. Uh, for example, if I was an attacker, I could, do, I could send my packets in this way. Let's say include uh, different extension headers and then fragment them. And since router advertisement guard um, uh, is, is, is a stateless mechanism, Kind of like hard to actually figure out whether packets should be passed or not. Uh, one of the problems with this is that um, the ITF published two RFCs about router advertisement guard. I think they were uh, well. The router advertisement guard was was uh, proposed by a big router vendor, and that big router vendor's implementation was trivial to circumvent. And not just that, but when we came up with the problem and uh, when we actually reported the problem. Uh, their answer was that, well, we don't need to fix that uh, because the solution to this problem is to use send, well, if you could deploy it, right? Uh, so after quite a bit of, of effort, we ended up uh, getting our ID uh, accepted by one of the ITF working groups, V6 operations, and uh, that document has just pay passed the, the working group last call. Um, the idea is that we, we, uh, we specified a set of rules to filter uh, router advertisement packets, trying to minimize the potential for false positives, right? And just finishing the, 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 this presentation, a uh, couple of comments on, about IPv6 firewalling. I mean, there's a lot of work to do with IPv6 firewalling. This is just like a single bit of it. This is uh, very related with what I discussed before. Uh, in IPv6, the uh, IPv6 header chain can, uh, can span across multiple fragments, right? So that's not something that could happen in IPv4. In IPv4, you could have fragments, but you will always have at least the transport, transport header, for example. In the case of v6, you could have a situation such as this, in which you receive, you receive this packet, and you cannot really tell what's inside that packet. The same thing with the second one. So that essentially means that if you uh, wanted to implement stateless filtering, in practice, you cannot. So the only way in which you could actually do firewalling in v6, if you know everything that the specifications allow, is to do stateful filtering. So what we propose here is to actually forbid this case and actually require all packets to have the entire uh, IPv6 header chain in the first fragment. So if you fragment packets, you better include all the header chain in the first fragment. Okay? Our proposal was originally to uh, require the whole header chain to be included within the 1280 bytes, which means the, the IPv6 MTU, but then some guys are against that and say that, well, the, probably a better number would be to use the PAT MTU. In practice, if I've never seen uh, a packet in the real world that has 1000 something uh, extension headers, right? And if you were to have such a packet, then you have uh, more headers than payloads, so you don't really want that case, but uh, in any case, there was people arguing against this. So this is something that was presented at the last ITF meeting, and uh, it's supposed, to, the, the, the um, six-month working group is supposed to be poll about adoption of, 
of this document. Uh, an internet draft, yeah, a proposal, but it has not been published as an, an RFC yet. And last one uh, has to do with amplification adducts. Uh, you may have read that, or uh, you may, have, yeah, you may have read that in IPv6 you cannot have smurf-like adducts because, for example, hosts are required to ignore, for example, ping packets sent to multicast addresses. But uh, there are cases, uh, there are some specific packets that can generate responses even when sent to uh, multicast addresses. One of the cases is to send uh, packets with unrecognized options of type 1,0 and then whatever. Uh, so our proposal in this case is essentially to ignore those packets and not to react by sending error messages. I mean, when it comes to an amplification attack, you don't care what's the response that you get. But as long as you get responses to something that you send to a multicast address, you get amplification. So uh, that's a proposal that, that we send to. So conclusions, uh, many vulnerabilities that um, have been found in IPv4 have been re-implemented in IPv6. In some cases, in the, in the specifications, in, the, in some cases, in the implementations, uh, there are possible reasons for which that may have happened. One is that we didn't uh, learn the lesson from the B4 uh, world. Another possible reason is that different people was working on one stack and on the other. Uh, the, in some cases, the specifications doesn't, don't really make it strive forward to implement the protocols. So I think that there is room for improvement there. And uh, there may be like a mix of all these reasons above. Uh, conclusion of this presentation is that there is a still a lot of work to do when it comes to IPv6 security. And uh, since we need to deploy v6 in the, on the internet, uh, we need to work to improve it. So I don't know if there's any question. So uh, there's uh, my email address, and we have a, a email list uh, for discussing these uh, basic security things.